what I'm going to do today is counter intuitive and probably completely counter against everything that you would possibly hear someone say on television. It's against. Common logic says follow the masses, go with the multitudes. That's common logic. But common spiritual understanding says go the other way from the masses. And be concerned with what God's word says. So let me start by saying this. This is going to be like a hodgepodge of ideas. Don't think I'm going to present. Sometimes I've done a message on a comma. Other times I've done message of one Greek word. Today I am presenting an overall perspective of something which cannot be understood except we begin first by understanding. And I'm grateful to Dr. Scott because he was the one that said, this is us. We start off as, he called it, flatheads, as babies. All we have is wants. I want, I want, I want. Now, this is the self. I want, I want, I want. I wonder if there's anybody you who have been taught from this ministry, I know the answer. The answer is yes. But I wonder if there's anybody out there listening for the first time who would consider money, stewardship, and giving from God's perspective, from the way God sees it. You see, we're so consumed with what God will do for us. God will bless you. These are the common preachments of today. If you'll sow your seed, if you'll plant a seed, see the return. It's all of these things that are catering to the self, by the way. You may say, how is that? And I will go on to explain why I'm saying this. But I hear no one explaining giving from God's perspective, GP, God's perspective. The reason why this is very important is because until we understand this lesson, the Church of Jesus Christ is not all about you. It is not all about your wants and your needs. You may come into the church with a need. I told you, this is going to be counter to what everybody else is saying. In fact, I'm going to give the warning right now to the people that are going to watch this on a replay somewhere. You need to listen to this before you shut it off. Listen to the whole thing and see if it's not completely opposite what everybody else is saying. But unlike everybody else, I'm telling you, it's in this book, not twisted according to what I'd like it to say, but according to what God has said and declared. I give an open challenge to say, anyone who wants to check out what I'm saying, please get a Bible and do so. I have nothing to hide. I'm not worried that you might discover the only person I've plagiarized here is God. <laughs> now, why this is problematic for me that we're, I'm, I'm addressing giving today. You may have come here today and you may have, you may have said, Pastor, I needed a word of, of uh, healing or forgiveness. Listen, we have an internet place where you can go 24 hours a day. Communion, you can get everything you need. This is something the church needs to hear. Not just the church out there, but I need to call some of you and remind you that this is what God's word looks like, rightly divided, not corrupted, not watered down. We're looking at God and God's perspective of giving. Now, we cannot understand or begin to understand the God perspective unless we first start with an understanding. Jesus, when he spoke of that parable of the sower, he said, if you cannot understand this parable, I'm not teaching from this today, I'm just mentioning it. If you cannot understand this, essentially I can't help you. You probably won't get it, don't worry about it. It's not for you to hear. Now most people, when they come into the church, they find that offensive because they're not familiar enough with God's word, and even if they read it, they can't really believe that God would say something like this. Not every person can receive the word of God. He gives an example, and I've always said it's one in four. And one out of four in the type can receive and bear fruit. And the fruit that, is, that comes forth is not for somebody else to pick. 
if not for somebody else to taste, unless you're Gavin DeGraw, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> but it's okay, if you don't know who that is, don't worry about it. But these ideas are very difficult for people to take in. To understand these principles, as Jesus said, here's the, here's the parable. So I'm gonna present it first as a paradox to you, and then I'm going to give you the examples through scripture. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of this. It's, it's a reduced down paradox. I'm gonna start with the, the smallest factor and build outward. I'm sure you've all read this somewhere on a menu. <laughs> Jumbo shrimp? That is taking a parable, if you will, and reduced it down to two words, which in English we call an oxymoron. This is an oxymoron. Jumbo shrimp. And yet it exists. It's a contradiction, but it's a true thing. Right? Jumbo shrimp. If you begin by understanding the paradox that two things are existing at the same time, a jumbo shrimp, jumbo and shrimp existing at the same time. Now, it's an oxymoron right now. It's not a paradox. But if you can understand two things existing at the same time that contradict each other, yet each are true, and they are apart but concomitant, it's, it's one of these things, logic defies the explanation. Now, I'm not here to tantalize you with the philosophical or the psychological. These are principles which will help our understanding of something. Many times here, when the paradox has been addressed, because the paradox will help us understand the line that comes right between God's uh, ideology or God's word to us and the self-seeking self-centered, carnal Christians. Oh, I just said a mouthful. The paradox. So, the paradox, as we have presented it many times, comes to us actually from the, the words of our Lord. He says things like, um, I'm giving you the Scott version, the first book of Scott version, you live by dying. Uh, if you read the Gospels, he says, he that is first shall be last, and the last shall be first. These are all concepts that we have taken in our mind, and don't think that I'm not coming to giving, because I am. We've taken in our mind, and we have, we have sifted in our understanding. I remember Dr. Scott used to call it the Aristotelian way of thinking, if this, then that, or therefore. I simply like to call it the self-centered, self-induced, it's all about me way of thinking. So. If the paradox is that uh, you get to go first by being last, I'll simply go last because, therefore, I will get to go first. Now, don't say I'm engaging in rhetoric because I'm trying to set, set the stage for something. You see, in Matthew 19, a man comes to Jesus. He's a rich man. And he says, Lord, what must I do to obtain eternal life, to inherit eternal life. And Jesus says to him, well, essentially this. Again, first book of Scott, sell everything you have, give to the poor. Oh, I'm missing one part in there, but then he says, and follow me. And the man went away very sorrowful because he had, it says he had great possessions. He, he, this one thing thou lackest, what Jesus just said, he went away very sorrowful. He could not part with his possessions. And then Peter says something equally disturbing. He comes up after this guy goes away, and he says, but Master, we've forsaken all. What are we going to get? <laughs> you got to love the fact that nothing is left out that's important for us, because although Peter was following the Lord, there was still that little tentacle of greed, oh boy. Now, Jesus also goes on to say, he who forsakes not, and he catalogs houses, lands, sister, mother, father, uh, wife, for my sake and the gospel. All right? And then he goes on to say he shall have a hundredfold, that's Matthew 19, and life eternal. Now, I'm going back to the paradox with this one example. If the criteria is forsaking, 
If that is the criteria, Jesus says to the, to the rich man, essentially, forsake all that you have. Those are the instructions. He says it elsewhere that you cannot be my disciple. Forsaking is the key word here. Then we must understand through the eyes of the paradox that what goes on today in the church world is not giving. It's investing. You see, the true concept of forsaking, as Jesus lays it out, there is no expectancy of return. When, when Jesus called to the disciples and said, follow me, before they were following him, was there a promise of anything? He said, follow me, I'll make you something you are not. Fishers of men. They were fisher, fishers indeed. That was their vocation, fishers of men. There was no guarantee apart from those words in the act of forsaking anything else. True forsaking, well, you, some people are going to say, ah, what's she saying here? Now, I'm going to make it clear that I'm not suggesting we forsake everything. I'm not telling you that that's the method of giving. I'm telling you that if my understanding, if you're reading the same scriptures that I am, go back in your own time and read Matthew 19 and find the concept of Peter saying, well, we forsake it all. He still thinks there's something maybe he might get. Jesus tells him, and also these things, forsaking these things. Some people here in this congregation will understand that concept of forsaking, and some will not. But forsaking means that there is no expectancy to receive apart from. In other words, if I leave this marker behind, I'm leaving it, and I do not expect a bye-bye, I don't expect to see you again. That's it. In fact, if you look in the Strong's under the word forsaking, my Strong's has something very funny. It says, adieu. French goodbye. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. So, in the concept of a paradox, why does Jesus say you must be willing to forsake? And then we have a whole mindset that has been built up around storing up not forsaking. See, the church has gotten so confused over these matters that in the process of confusion, we've actually forgotten what it is that Jesus was trying to get at the heart of in speaking to the rich man in the first place. Christ must have preeminence in your life. If you wish to follow and become a son or a daughter of God, he's not saying, I suggest that you abandon everything. Otherwise, if you read, there are some here in the sanctuary who have forsaken. They have said adieu to friends, houses, lands. They have said goodbye to that. They have said, that is what was hindering me from following. I'm saying goodbye to it. It is the paradox that once understood, only God can see the heart. When you are willing to put it to the side, you will find that God somehow he manages to put it back in your hand. The motivation cannot be, I'll get it back. My proof of this is Abraham bringing and offering up Isaac. There was no guarantee that if he actually carried out the, the act of offering up Isaac, there was no guarantee. Although he had faith, we read that text and we think, genius. He had such great faith, but there was no guarantee. The motivation could not have been well, if I kill this one, me and Sarah will just have to go in the tent again. <laughs> there was no... I'm just checking, because some, some of you may be going, yeah, okay, Pastor, listen, come on. But once God saw the willingness, there is your Old Testament concept of forsaken. Once God saw the willingness, the paradox is he was not willing that that promised seed should perish. Therefore, now, that is the supreme paradox. If understood right, most of what goes on today is not from God's perspective. It is self-indulgent fueling of carnal greed. Hmm. Let me say that again. Sounds delicious when you turn on the TV and you hear somebody saying, oh, if you, if you just put it here, you'll get it back tenfold. It sounds delicious. How enticing! 
how satanic that the church world has swallowed up a ball of greed and is getting fatter and fatter on greed rather than seeing that the very thing that God designed as a purpose has now turned to be serving the self. You tell me something's not off. If giving is taught or right, tell me, from God's perspective, why do we need a justification for it? If giving is taught or right and God's word says, this do, why do we have to, why is the church world spending all of its time trying to find a justification and a rationale for something that God said, this do? Well, it's rhetorical. I said to you, the greatest concept that is overlooked by almost every single minister that I encounter, Jesus Christ himself said, see to it wherever this gospel is preached, that you also tell what this woman, speaking of the woman with the alabaster box did, tell me, why do we need to invent things and caricature and try and entice and lure? When these are the words of our Lord and Savior, I hear people saying, I want to have God's will. I want to know God's will for my life. Well, friend, you better start off by forgetting about this down here and coming into the church and learning about God's perspective first. Don't seek to find a secret revelation for your private life before you have come to understand the will of God revealed in His Word, which includes the giving of money. It's not excluded when people say, well, I just... I it makes me tremble to think of the fact that I'll be giving my money and I don't know where it's going. There is an entity that the church world has lost its mind. There's an entity that comes, without giving the acronyms, I will not mention the name of the entity, they come and they supervise ministries and their money to, make, to ensure that the ministry is transparent so that the people can see what, what happens with the money. Now, you who read the Bible, you find that in the scriptures for me. You out there who have succumbed to this, find in the scriptures. You know what I love about God's word? That if you're preaching God's word, there are some real hard, cold truths you're going to be confronted with. Were there corrupt priests in Jesus' day? Were there corrupt priests in Jesus' day? You want to know how corrupt? People will read right by this while Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and commending them about the tithe. He rebuked them for the things they left neglected, but he's commending them about the tithe. And here they are putting their money into the treasury, the same treasury where the widow put her two mites. Does anybody stop to think that that same treasury was where they took the 30 pieces of silver from to give to Judas to go and betray our Lord? and you're worried about corruption in the church today, the original part of corruption is right there in the Bible. Hello? The very money put in out of sacrifices from the widow's might or abundance from the Pharisees was used to buy and betray Judas to Jesus, the betrayal of Jesus. So don't talk to me about I'm worried about what happens with the money. That is a world perspective. That is not a God perspective. Now God, in his word, gives us the importance of giving. And in diverse ways, this is where I begin to show you what kind of a God we serve, that he stamped certain priorities on giving. Tell me, what type of a God who created heaven and earth, created every living thing, every creature, every animal, would be appeased by an animal sacrifice. And yet, God says, this thing pleases me. People have trouble getting their mind around that in the laws of the offering, as you read the book of Leviticus, the opening chapters of Leviticus, God sets out what are the set offerings that he has prescribed through the priesthood for the people. He begins with, the burnt offering, then he goes to the meat, he goes to the peace, 
And then we have the sin and trespass offerings. These offerings laid out for us, God starts with, as you've, said it, you've heard it said here before, God starts first with what is closest to his heart, the burnt offering, sweet, savor, completely ascending. It's holocaust, the word is, completely ascending to God, for God. There is nothing that remains for the person who offered. It is completely and wholly offered up to God. God, in the unfolding of his laws of offering, he begins with what is completely offered up to him. These follow the sin and trespass offerings. Now, the last time I did this, I left the platform lamenting that I didn't say what I'm going to say. All of these represent offerings to God. These three here, and specifically this one, when you begin reading the book of Leviticus in the first chapter, says how this is completely offered up to God. It's a sweet savor to him, sweet savor offerings. And these, these two offerings here, we begin to see that if a man wants to come to God, as God unfolds in his word, he starts with what pleases him first and then gets to our need. And when we come to God, we begin by looking at the trespass offering. That is the sins that the church spends so much time fussing about. Oh, you know, that guy drinks, he smokes, he cusses. She wears short skirts, she wears makeup, she has long hair, she has short hair, she wears a hat, she doesn't wear a hat, she breathes. <laughs> trespass offering. Whatever, whatever your trespasses, whatever, whatever itemizing you wish to call it, which I always say is quite nonsensical because the whole church world starts here on the way back to God. In other words, when God reveals himself in his word, he starts with what is important to him, what, is, what pleases his heart, and works his way towards our needs. We begin, we begin our journey in the trespass offering, looking toward God but so far away. Most of the church world is stuck at the trespass offering, if you will. They never get beyond the fact that this offering here for sin was for the condition of humankind, of fallen Adam. So most of the church says, if you can get rid of this, you will have eliminated the sin in your life and you can go on and meet the approach to God. But rather, this trespass is not the root, but it is the fruit of this fallen condition. So we must deal with the condition of mankind, fallen, and then eventually, hopefully, make our way towards the heart of God in understanding. You see, when I first came into the church, I was fussing about the trespasses in my life. I speak for me, but I know it's true for all of you because it's so confusing. You come in, <laughs> count them all up, and then you go, oh boy. And then as you get a little closer to God in understanding, you begin to understand that your condition is fallen in Adam, your condition, humanity. I've used the phrase many times, Adam's sin plunged the blueprint of humanity into sin, no more in the image of God, but in the image of Adam we are. And therefore, I look back at these trespasses and recognize that these trespasses are the fruit of this fallen condition. And as I get to know and understand God a little bit better and make my way towards him, understanding what pleases God, the burnt offering, what is offered to him, pleasing to him, I understand my conditions were met already. Now, the church world is stuck right here in the trespass and sin department, stuck in what I need, what I have to have happen, my everything about me to fix and get and cater. And that's why I said from the God perspective, when you understand what God laid out in the, in the laws of offering, you begin to see that the heart of God, he unfolds what is closest to him first. And when we make our approach to God, he lets us start where we are. That's the beautiful thing. But most of the church is still stuck in the laws of offering, if you will, in the concepts, they're still stuck at the last two. 
coming to God and approaching God with something that has no strings attached that I will not have any part in, but I offer it up to God. Most of the church is not there yet. Now, lest you think, well, that's a one-hit wonder. We see the same thing in the tabernacle, the same concepts in the same order. When, I love this, because most of you know what's coming. Moses goes up in the mount, 40 days he comes down. God tells him, when you come down from the mount, speak unto the children that they take up. Oh, all right. Because if you would have said something else, I think I would have fallen over. <laughs> What did he say? Now, speak to the children of Israel and begins to, and I have you note something. I've always passed this by too. In that Exodus 25, in those opening verses, read carefully with a willing heart with a willing heart. This will actually be the key to something I really want to say to you regarding God's pers perspective. He puts in there, it's like a footnote. Take up an offering, and then if any man will bring with a willing heart. Just hang that out a peg in the back of your mind there for a minute. And the offering is expressly taken up for the tabernacle, that God's presence may come and dwell among his people. And in the process of that, he does the same thing, like the laws of the offering, he does the same thing, beginning first, as these details are given, beginning first, he says in the description now, behind the, the Holy of Holies, if you will, you've got the Ark of the Covenant, you've got the mercy seat. These are all the instructions within the unfolding that God says take up an offering. You've got Ark of the Covenant, you've got the mercy seat. If you keep going, you'll have the, uh, the lamp. I may have missed one. You've got a veil somewhere. You've got a lamp. The lamp stand, uh, Ark, mercy seat, missed one over here, and the table of showbread. Showbread, that looked good. All right. The point is, in the, in the most holy place, speaking of what belongs to God, the Ark of the Covenant typifying Christ, God's presence right there, that box symbolizing not only God's presence, if you will, but typifying Christ, we have what is closest to God first. And as we progress outward, we see certain things. And people come to this very end demonstration, altar of incense is what I missed. We come to this very last item right here, the table of showbread, and understand that this is actually where we should start. We're outside. We are at the very outside. In fact, if you want to see God's presence, God's presence is only right here. His Shekinah glory, if you will, begins at the very heart of where he has revealed himself, right here. And progressively, as you go beyond, you're, you're headed towards the door. That's a good place to go. But you're headed towards the door. You, we're, we're on the inside going out. We've got the table of showbread, which was not, as many people have said, a type of Christ, but the offering on the table itself, a picture of what God gave to the people, an offering from the people to God. Very simple. Now, you might say this is all... Well and wonderful, but God keeps doing the same thing and showing what his heart sees, what pleases him, what his desire is, and then we come into the church and we say, I need this, I need that, I want God to bless me, I want this, and we just keep, we keep adding on. Now, I'd say the analogy here breaks down in that the trespass, most I said, stay here, it's pretty hard to get around this idea. There are people in the church who think every sacrifice should be provided for them, including the bread that was on that table of showbread. They shouldn't have to do anything. I've heard people say, I don't want to come into a church where I have to give money. Well, let me tell you something. There is no church without a giving people inside, not because the church cannot exist without your money, 
but because at the core of everything, fundamentally, if you have to be manipulated and motivated and coerced and kicked and can't figure out that through God's book, there has been a pattern of revelation regarding what pleases God. It's not enough to say, well, I get these concepts, but they're archaic. They were given to us as a pattern for us to see. Beginning here, I go back to this burnt offering, holy and completely offered up to God. If you want to give some idea of why it grieves me to the core every time I hear people saying, so a seed, the expectancy, I go back to my first statement about forsaking. Could you possibly offer up a burnt offering, that which is a sweet savor to God, and consider and understand this is an act of completely forsaking. It is an act of complete and utter devotion to God that is presented, and you don't go back and reach apart and take it back for yourself or expect that once you've offered that thing, God will bring something else back. The paradox to all this is God said, take up an offering to build all these things that God's presence might abide. Can you imagine modernize? Oh, forgive me, and I don't mean to be blasphemous. Modernize what happened in the Bible. So rather than Moses coming down from the mount after 40 days and saying, speak to the people, God says to Moses, speak unto the people and take up an offering. No explanation from the get-go. He didn't explain to them just yet. He didn't say, this is everything that God revealed to me up in the mount. We spent 40 days, and I'm going to give you the, the uh, special students' study notes that all, it'll only take me about five minutes to tell you all what he said. Or rather, Moses comes down from the mount after 40 days, and he says, listen, I have an announcement. Now, before I take up this offering, before we do anything here, I want to know if you want a place to come in to call your own, called the worship zone. Do you want to have a tent that's built just for you? Now, I'm modernizing right now. I'm giving you what would happen if Moses came down off the mount today in today's churches. It would be, do you want to have a part of that tent because it can be yours if you'll sow your seed into it right now? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yes, it is absolute blasphemy that we have, yes, <laughs> tell me why, tell me why we have had to come up with new ideas. I said this last week, I'll say it again, F.B. Meyer was right, there are no new ideas, we just need to rediscover the old ones. They're the good ones. They work. They're not broken. So you see, here alone, and I, I'm not going to make any excuses for what I'm doing today. You see, here alone, there's enough examples that I have given you that if I were to just camp out here on this, but unfortunately, or no, rather fortunately, it doesn't end there. You see, I could take examples from anywhere. I told you from any place in the book, God has given examples of a response to his saving touch on the believer's life. In Noah's case, he comes out of the ark after the waters had abated, and his first act is to build an altar and offer up burnt offerings. Now, whether God told him that that's what he ought to do, or he instinctively and intuitively did it on his own, I, I'm not going to engage in speculation. I am going to tell you this. There were only eight people, and if you minus him, that means seven, there, but there were eight people saved on that ark, plus all the animals. So whatever massive amount of offering that he offered to God, which it says he offered up quite a sum of animals before the Lord as burnt offerings, completely offered up unto God, there was nobody there except for the seven other people. Do you think he was doing it and saying, okay, everybody, through seven, you better watch what I'm doing because I'm... I'm I'm offering up a big amount of offerings, and I want you seven people in my family to see what I'm doing. Matthew 6. Matthew 6 tells us we are to do our alms, our righteousness, in secret. 
Now, it would be pretty hard to offer up those burnt offerings in secret, but I don't think he made a fanfare about it is what I'm trying to say. You can go to any place in the Bible, friends, and you'll find the same thing. In fact, I'd like to read you one thing because I, I underscored out of Exodus a willing heart. But if you'll take the time, you'll find that that willing heart repeats itself. And in the most improbable place, I'm going, I would like to show you what attitude sets God and the God perspective, not self, and everything I've said here, plus the willing heart. In First Chronicles, in chapter 29, and they have finished building, or it's an offering for the temple. So this is during David's day. And I begin just to give you an idea to highlight a few verses and read David's prayer. Because it says, the rulers of the king's work offered willingly. And in verse 9 again, chapter 29, verse 9, then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. You'll see this is a pattern that when things are offered to God with a willing heart, I began with the children of Israel and God's instructions, and here's David saying the same thing. Now when David prays, and you, his prayer is quite staggering. But I begin at verse 12 to just show you an idea of how the king himself, amongst, amidst all of this splendor, he says, both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? Have you heard anybody saying this of late? Have you heard anybody preaching this? Who are we that we should be able to bring abundantly to God? No, we have an attitude that says, we're, we're a special people. Well, we are special people. Get it right from the God perspective. Here is a man after God's own heart, and he says we are strangers before these sojourners. Our days on earth are as a shadow. There is none abiding. O Lord, our God, all this store, all this abundance that we have prepared to build thee a house for thine holy name, cometh thine hand and is all thine own. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, that is in the honesty of the intent of what I have done, I willingly offered all these things, and now I have seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. And you might say, well, I've underscored all this to show there are things that do get God's attention. There are many things not recorded in the book that we don't have a record of, but here is an underscoring of a principle that began by God saying to the children of Israel in Exodus 25, take up an offering to build the house. See, they do it with a willing heart, willingly. Now, why am I saying this and emphasizing this willingly? Because through and through, you'll find many of these things along the way, these concepts, crystallize not the activity per se. They crystallize God's view of the actors carrying out the act. Only God knows the heart. Now, I know it sounds harsh to say the word greed, but it's only greed that taps into these ideas. Jesus said, you know, what you speak about the most, whatever comes out of your mouth, that's usually what's in a person's heart. When you can get excited about the multiplication of your money, hey, who doesn't want to make money with their money? But if that's your focus, go outside the church to do it. Find a specialty person that can do that, if that's your focus. Why are we doing this in the church? If you want guarantee, visible, absolute in the now, you should not be in the church. But if you are a faithing person, believing even in the worst of times, the Lord will make a way where there is no way. The Lord will let me put him first. These are, these are ideas that when I first heard them, I thought, 
Well, that's impossible. How could you put God first when you don't have enough? How could you put God first when you don't have anything? And this is why I come back to the widow and her two mites. If God saw, and he did, this woman giving out of her the very, what was needed for her to survive, and she was doing a wrong thing, he would have stopped her and said, no, 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 no. He would have put his body over the treasury and said, no. You need those two mites. Considering how many people cast into that treasury, why did her two mites matter? These are rationale of people. Well, I don't have a very large offering, so I shouldn't give anyway. You should give for the single purpose that from God's perspective, this thing that we call the offering pleases him. Why do we need to come up with some other idea? I've told you I, I teach the principles of Galatians 6.6 6, to tell you you have a responsibility as I teach you to respond. Beyond that, I'm not interested in people coming up with fancy ideas of how to, how to make something multiply, but this is where my paradox will kick in, and you'll say, well, I understand why you said all this now. My paradox kicks in because I want you now to turn with me to 2 Corinthians, where I've been spending a whole lot of time. 2 Corinthians and the ninth chapter. Now, remember what I said to you about willful giving. Willful giving. Willful giving. 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 7, verse, Every man, as he purposeth in his heart, italicized, so let him give, not grudgingly. Some of you may have a note in your Bible, because I taught on this before, and you may have the word in your Bible, lupe. We used to have a gentleman by the name of Lupe that worked for us. Now every time we mention the name Lupe, we think we associate it with this, grief and sorrow, because that's what it means. Do you know, we'll, leave, we'll even leave it right here, do you know how many people are pushed into giving, reluctantly pushed into giving, causing grief and sorrow because, well, you know, the pastor keeps talking about giving and, oh, God. Can we talk about something else? There are plenty of people that listen. And this is why I feel sorry for those that have the reaction like this today, because you're listening to someone who is absolutely certain of something on this wise. God doesn't need your money. C.S. Lewis said it, God to be God doesn't need your money. But there are certain things God said pleases him. You'll find elsewhere, Paul calls the giving of money a sweet, savor offering unto God. That is the equivalent of the burnt offering. He calls it that. While most of the church is still right, de right, right down there on trespass lane. You know, I think, you might think I'm making a lot of humor, but the thing that really gets to me and it gets under my skin, and it has actually gotten into my heart and my mind that there are so many people out there sitting in pews and listening to people being duped, being robbed of their rewards, being indoctrinated with poor, unbiblical, unsound, if you will, and forgive that English, ideas about God's way, when God's way, he never had a committee of people come in and investigate to see just how much bread are those preceding? Because we gave that bread, we, we, we ground up that manna you gave us, and we brought it and we put it there. Just how much bread are the priests eating? You know, that brother, someone saw you got a nice little round shape to you, looking like the Michelin man. <laughs> but how is it we've managed to bring in these ideas? that are now universally accepted if you're not part of this acronym uh, organization and you don't open up your books for the church, this is not good. Wait a minute. God only said one thing from the God perspective. You bring your offering. Now, if you place your offering in the hands of someone who is corrupt, believe me, God, who is still God, just like the false prophets I've been talking about, God will still deal with those 
You need to be concerned with what God is looking at in your activity of faith, in your doing. Not, well, what's going to happen to it once it gets there. Now, for the discerning people, I always say this to you. I don't say, hey, we're raising money for this, and we need money for that. Oh, we're creatures. We have creature needs. We have needs. There's no denying that. I believe if every single person hears me today, there should be a desire, a deep desire, to not only respond, but to be consistent in that response. We used to say we have the largest, Dr. Scott used to say, the largest per capita giving in a church that, based on what people say, you know what I'm looking for today? I'm not looking for largest per capita giving, although that's really nice to be able to say or not say. I'm looking for every single person who is hearing this message to understand. These folks at Corinth had to have a wake-up call. Paul says, you prove the genuineness of your spirituality by the way you give, by what flows out of you. You want to know what this looks like? What is placed in you? is the Spirit of Christ. And we know the Spirit of Christ in another place. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Though rich, he became poor, giving everything for your sake and mine. By the way, people say, well, are you preaching a debtor message? Absolutely not. This is why I say to you, if you understand the paradox, if you and I are looking at the God perspective and only God can see the heart, as we bring our tithes and offerings, as we bring what we're bringing into God's house, placing it into the hand of the teacher, the one who taught you. In the early days, they laid it at the apostles' feet. I prefer you not lay it at my feet. I never said I was like those in the... Just make the checks payable to Pastor Melissa Scott. But in the meantime, when people say... This idea of giving from God's perspective, let's do away with. You say, well, what, what, what do you mean? I'm not going to get any blessings? This is the problem. I've not been able to tell you as a congregation or the ones listening to me about God's blessings because the charlatan, caricatured, weirdo people in, out there in TV land, all they do is talk about God's blessings like it's something to be tossed around for everybody. God's blessings are available to God's people. And I'll tell you one thing. The tragedy is a person like me who has kept silent for these many years because I'm worried to be thrown in the camp of people who so cheaply toss around God's grace, not understanding this paradox, which I'm about to say. If you come to God, and the key word here is forsaking, you expect nothing. You come and your heart says, the Lord said through his word to bring it here, and that's what I'm doing. Here is the paradox. No strings attached? Nope. No considerations of what might happen to the money? Nope. Listen to what's said here. For God loves a cheerful giver, a hilarious giver. God loves a hilarious giver. Now, what did I say about willing heart from Exodus I could quote from different places, but off the top of my head, Exodus, 1 Chronicles 29, we'll go straight through. You can find them everywhere in the Bible, of a willing heart. God loves a hilarious giver. Now, you've heard that said many times, but put it in the framework of how you bring your offering. Are you bringing your offering motivated by, enshrined by, enshrined by driven by the self, the wants, the needs, or from the God perspective, God looking at you. Oh, people love to quote this. God loves a hilarious giver. Ah, yeah, I give hilariously. <laughs> See, we come with such immaturity. We're so busy nitpicking right here. We can't even get to the mind and heart of God unless God's Spirit placed in us do you want to know another reason why God loves a hilarious giver? Not just because he loves it and it pleases him. There is a reflection of something coming out of you as a believer. See, God gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, and it says that gift was given to us to glorify Jesus Christ, not to glorify ourselves, to glorify Jesus Christ. So in the process 
of becoming a hilarious giver, what pleases God is he sees a mirror image of his son and his son's likeness in us because his son was a hilarious giver. He sees that, it pleases him. Now, I don't know why you'd look for some other reason or some other justification or some other manipulation or some other need. If need is your cause to raise money, you should go become a charity. The church is not a charity. Now you know why some of you send money and I send the money back because you put on there you want to designate it to something. You're not sending designated funds. I, I don't want to be talked to like that. Well, good. <laughs> I'm the custodian. I'm responsible. You know, most people... Uh, most people... No, listen to what I'm going to say to you. Most people are not... They're not well-versed enough on the law to understand designated funds in a church. You know, Dr. Scott had genius on this, but God gave me a little bit of wisdom. Don't say you're raising money for something. That's why we, when we've done things, we do secrets. People say, I participate in the secret. Well, I'm not, what is the secret? I'm not telling you, that's why it's called a secret. <laughs> designated funds, by virtue of their designation, require that when somebody says, I'm giving money for this express purpose, if the money is not used for that express purpose, if one is law-abiding and not corrupt, you must send the money back. Otherwise, you must carry out the set purpose that you have said. That's why I said, we don't do that. Now, some people are just catching on to that 20 and 30 years after the fact of what has been set in place here. You give money as a response to God's word, you give money if you want from the God perspective because it pleases him. You give money. I could, I could just open up and, and say, building on what I've just said, but why, tell me, should it be to tap into your greed? You know, oh, I'm not greedy. <laughs> I just wanted to see if I could get a little bit from Uncle Sam and a little bit here. Do you know I still have people sitting in front of me right now who I've taught for many years who still want to turn in their tax records to get credit for their giving to the church still today. And you say, well, how do I know that? This is one time where I know what I know what I know because that is just, that's the human side of the equation. What's the matter? I had somebody argue with me. What's wrong with trying to get a, a few dollars from Uncle Sam? Well, listen. I've just told you there's no reason to let some person come in and analyze how much bread the priest is eating. What is God's belongs to God. What is Caesar's is Caesar's. You render unto Caesar that which belongs to him. You pay your taxes. That's what you ought to do. But I'm not sure why you'd want to let Uncle Sam know every single thing you do, including your giving, which should be Matthew 6, done in secret. Ah. <laughs> now... One may say, what else do you have to give me here, Pastor? Well, i got one more thing to tell you. God is able. I could just put a period right there. God is able. <laughs> God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things. Now, I'll probably translate this on festival because it needs a little attention, but the gist of it is having enough to stand alone having enough that after you have given hilariously you will have enough to be sufficiently standing on your own now that is what god is able to do you don't begin with somebody so how i'm going to start giving today because i want all grace abounding to me <laughs> then you're not giving according to what i just explained you see when you begin to look at God's perspective, you begin to respond to God and the offerings that you bring, it's no longer about what am I going to get back. And when the attitude ceases to be expectant, which is that forsaking, read the other part of that. I'm going to make a general statement about forsaking all because essentially if you want the paradox of forsaking all, in forsaking all, everything's given to you. You want me to say that again? In forsaking all, 
everything is given to you. You can't forsake all to get all. That's what the church world has done. They've peddled the idea that if you give, you will get. That is erroneous. Missing the mark, exactly that. You're not giving, by the way. You're just putting out a little bit of money over here, investing it or gambling away, but you're certainly not forsaking in giving. So my challenge for those people who have some issues with the church and with money, I've mentioned enough scriptures. I've taught enough principles today, as I said, a general principle, an overall overview of what one could expect, which is essentially counter to what everybody else is saying. It is completely against the multitudes. Be nice, be kind, speak soothing words, tell the people what they want to hear. And Paul says that there will come a time where people will not endure sound doctrine. Now, I'm not sure if we're in that time or not, but it's my responsibility to teach that sound doctrine that says, if you are part of God's program, if you have heard and received and you understand, Quit making the excuses. Quit looking for the rationale. Quit trying to justify. Begin to look at God's perspective. You know, we call it the bird's eye view. Forgive, because that sounds terrible. The bird's eye view, looking down on humanity. If you were God, looking down on humanity and seeing the way giving has been cheapened and tossed around, looking down, if you were sitting, better yet, you were sitting beside God, looking down at humanity and looking at the shameful way money has been disgustingly uh, become, it's, it's, it's a product of our culture. This is why this ministry is unique. I'm not worried if you like what I'm saying or not. My concern is that God, I envision right now God sitting and looking down and saying, here in this city, now there may be somebody else somewhere else, but in this city there's at least one person concerned about my perspective from my vantage point telling the people who profess to be my people the way I want it done. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.